I can remember a time when I was about 10 years old. I'd wake up really early on Saturday morning, Game Boy in hand, ready to tune into the latest episode of Pokemon. An episode that always stuck out to me was the 8th or so episode, where Ash met a trainer named AJ. Now AJ had a Sandshrew, and well, he basically whips his Pokemon and brutally trains them with methods like forcing a ground type to swim into water, for example. Now Ash didn't agree with AJ, how he trained his Pokemon, but even as a kid I kind of found it hard to argue with the results that he had almost a 100-0 record. And maybe there's something to that. Today we have a Sandshrew of our own and I'm ready to follow in AJ's footsteps. Now grab you a spray bottle, a whip, and some sodi pop, and let's take a deeper look into Sandshrew's stats and move pool. Something that may jump out to you at the start is that Sandshrew has a special of 30 and we know, we all know how fun Gen 1 is with low special. It also has pretty abysmal speed. It does sport a pretty solid 75 attack and an even higher defense, but in my opinion it's one of the weaker stats and merely takes away from the more useful stats. Now looking at the move pool, it doesn't really get much better. For leveling up, Sandshrew is in this weird group of Pokemon, kind of like uh, Voltorb, where it's a certain type, but it only learns normal moves for some reason. It starts off with a measly scratch, uh, and it gets Sand Attack at level 10, and that's ultimately kind of what we gotta work with for Brock, unless we have to bump it all the way up to level 17 for Slash, which is probably gonna be the possibility. Also notice that it learns Poison Sting at level 24 for no real reason at all. I kind of found it to be sort of random and worth pointing out. As for TMs, uh, it does have a glimmer of hope. Sentry has a pretty good attack stat, so things like Body Slam and Dig can take full advantage of that in the early game, while Earthquake and Rock Slide will come in handy late. It also gets Seismic Toss and the very valuable Swords Dance to help out in both of its attack and speed as well as serve as a way to enable everyone's favorite badge boost glitch. I'm going to point out the obvious here, Sentra's ground top, and we've seen how the cube on run went. This time I don't start out with a decent move, but instead we'll have to scratch Brock while having to worry about Misty and Erica after that. And I really don't want to think about Lorelai at this point in time, but in the back of your mind, you know it's coming. I mention this sometimes, but for all of my runs, I do reset several times to get decent DVs on my Pokemon. Without explaining too much to anyone who already knows, or spending too much time for anyone who doesn't, each Pokemon basically has a set of hidden detriment values that range anywhere from 0 to 15 in each stat, on top of its species base stats. Meaning that the difference between a Sandshrew with 0 DV in speed versus one with a 15 DV in speed could easily be the difference in being able to get past a battle early. So I'm using this as an example, but essentially all you need to know is that I'm resetting until I get an alright Sandshrew. The goal is basically that I don't want an awful one, because why would you do these challenges and pick the worst version of the Pokemon you are doing it with when they're already kind of bad in the first place? Now here's a quick reminder of the rules if you aren't familiar. Number one, no using items in battle. Number two, Sandshrew is the only Pokemon I can use in battle. This includes no switching for any reason. Number three, no use of skips, exploits, or glitches outside of the badge boost, which is inevitable. And number four, no saving between Elite Four members to promote consistent strategies rather than retrying the part you get stuck on over and over until you brute force your way through it with luck like some channels out there. And before we dive into the run, I'd like to go ahead and say that if you enjoy this content, I'd really appreciate you if you subscribed. Uh, this channel is getting pretty close to 10k, and that would be pretty cool to get to. Also hit that like button if you feel so inclined. I also love any constructive comments or any general feedback as well. Suggestions are also welcome. Now I know the intro went on a little longer than usual, but listen guys, I want it to be thorough and statistical on this one to kind of provide an actual in-depth look to see how it goes. I also think it's important to note that I'm writing this initial part before I actually do the run, so you can comment below predicting how you think I'm going to do. I predict something similar to Cubone, slightly better. Um, we'll see how that pans out. I'm going to toss out a 7 hour, 25 minute prediction uh, for the pre-run. 
Now let's get into it. Sentry gets past the initial rifle battle, and I know that Brock isn't feasible with minimum battles, so I pick up the optional bug catchers on the way, and I grind just a little bit, and I make sure I give Brock a try at level 10. This allows me access to the dirtiest move in the game, Sand Attack, but I don't quite have the stats to get past it just yet, as predicted. So at that point, I go back, I grind up to level 13, and we head to Brock once again, just to see how it goes, but I haven't given my Sandshrew enough AJ training yet, so back to the wild we go, back to the swimming pool. And this attempt really wasn't that bad. So once again, we grind a little more, and we go back to try Brock at level 15 to see if we can somehow squeak by. But I don't have enough PP, even if I wanted to win this fight. Even if the fight went exactly how I needed it to go, it would still be rough and I'd probably have to struggle. So this forces us to get to level 17, and we get access to Slash, a very important move for the run, but for Brock, all you really need to know and all we need to talk about is that it gives us enough PP to not have to use Struggle. Now the overall strategy here is a little dirty, you sand attack both of his Pokemon the maximum 6 times and just slowly chip away. Now with Slash and its increased critical rate, the Onyx goes down fairly quick and Sandshrew has passed what will probably be the biggest hurdle in his run uh, along with the biggest grind that we'll have to do. So now before we go any further let's talk about Slash and we're gonna segue to Math Minute. Now hopefully you got some Sody Pop left but I feel the need to explain something that often gets glossed over by other channels. To understand just how strong Slash will be in this upcoming early game segment of the game, I'll need to take a little bit of time to deep dive into critical hits into Generation 1. Usually the Pokemon games give each Pokemon a baseline 1 out of 16 chance to crit, but Generation 1 is different. It bases critical hits off of the Pokemon's base speed. This means that slow Pokemon have low chances, while Pokemon like Electrode will have pretty high rates. The critical hit formula goes as follows, it is base speed times 100 divided by 512. In Sanchu's case, it has a very poor speed of 40, so if you do the relevant math, it comes out to roughly a 7.81% chance to crit, which is roughly 1 out of 13, not really that great. Now here's where Slash comes in. Slash is a move along with Crab Hammer and Karate Chop for example that applies a flat 8 times modifier to crit chance when used. This means that when Sanctuary uses Slash, we have just a hair under 62.5% chance to crit, which is roughly 3 fifths of the time that we use it, we'll be getting that crit, baby. It's also important to know that crits apply their damage based on the base stats of a Pokemon, and they ignore any stat changes, whether it be from you using a growth on your own Bellsprout, or having moves done against you like Leer or Growl. Critical hits also get stronger as the game goes on, and the formula for the crit damage multiplier is also pretty simple. It is 2 times your level plus 5 divided by your level plus 5. To put it simple, this means that a level 5 Pokemon's critical hits do 1.5 times damage and a level 80 Pokemon will do 1.94 times damage. Now roughly on this stretch of the game we're going to be about level 20 so that means that we'll be doing 1.8 times damage on our critical hits. I say all this just to provide some insight to Slash. I touched on the Bellsprout video why Razor Leaf wasn't that great on Bellsprout, but I never really went into the numbers on exactly why. At the end of the day is what I'm trying to say is that we now have Slash, and on the surface it looks like a 70 base powered normal move, but 3 fifths of the time it's a 126 base powered nuke that ignores stat changes and will near one shot anyone unlucky enough to get caught in Sentry's path and this move will be useful even after we grab Body Slam on the SSN. This move won't become useless until we can pick up Swords Dance and the critical hits ignoring stat changes will become a hindrance rather than a boost for us. Anyways, back to our regularly scheduled Sentry solo run. And guys, we're critically hitting everyone out here. Not even the women or the children are safe from Sandshrew's wrath. I battle pretty much everyone on the way uh, through Mount Moon, all the way up to Mount Moon and inside of Mount Moon, just in anticipation for 
some rough fights later on. I do skip the hikers that have rock tops, but we're just, we're critting everybody. I'm just showing crit after crit right here. And eventually, I get the Helix Fossil, and now it's time for Cerulean. And obviously, Misty is a problem, and my Sand True isn't quite as good as AJ's just yet. So for that, we go to rival number two. And we avoided the initial sand attacks from Pidgeotto and sweep through the rest of his team. And this is thanks to the fact that I went ahead and battled the extra trainers on the way so that I didn't get stuck here and I had to go back to grind on level 8 Ekans until I'm able to get past it like I did with the Cubone run. After the rival battles, the trainers on the way up to Bill's house offered no challenge, but it did give me some much needed levels to kind of counteract the problems that will be coming up. Eventually, I obtained Dig, which is, it's tied with Earthquake as Sentry's most powerful move, a stab 100 base power move that will make short work of nearly every trainer, including Misty. Or so I had hoped. I initially thought level 26 was the magic number to be able to outspeed Star U and make Star B manageable on the first fight, and it looked to be the case. I do get obliterated by a critical hit that AJ didn't really prepare me for at all, and much to my surprise, on the second attempt, it turns out that it was actually a speed tie against the Star U. So ignore the fact that I'm still riding a slash induced high rather than using the much superior dig. Uh, I just, I want those crits and it's the only way I can really feel anymore. So with this new information that it was a speed tie, I head back up to the Nugget Bridge and fight the two or so trainers that I skipped and I get that last crucial level needed to outspeed Star U without the coin flip. And you might be saying, Matt, why is it so important to beat Misty right this instant? And to that, I say that if you beat Misty now, I can heal in Cerulean, head down to Vermilion, get cut, fight Lieutenant Surge, grab the bike voucher, dig all the way back to Cerulean, and then continue my game. And if I had to bypass Misty now, it means that I won't be able to use cut so that I would have to come back up to Cerulean and then go back down to Cerulean and make some extra trips and it would cost me a lot more time in the long run than it would to just go ahead and fight these two easy trainers right now. As I do more and more runs, I'm becoming better at route planning and being more time conscious rather than just winging it so that I don't have the awful times like I had in my initial Slowpoke or Clefairy run. So now you know that. Anyways, this gets us to level 27. Back at Misty, I'm still thinking that uh, slash coin flip crits are the way to go and the star you survives it puts crucial damage on me and we can't survive star me's attacks eventually I do learn from my mistakes and I use a dig the pokey gods reward our decision by giving us a critical hit against the star me ending the fight very fast getting us past what was supposed to be one of Sandshrew's biggest hurdles in the run and I'd like to think that AJ is definitely smiling down upon me right now I head over to the SSN, I go straight for Body Slam, the youngster gets caught up in the Slash Blender and I critically murder his Nidoran. I teach Body Slam, but I still keep Slash because at this point, they're both powerful in their own ways. And now it's time for rival number 3. I somehow avoid Sand Attacks during my first attempt, but my arrogance of not healing may have cost me the first try, that or maybe it's the Kadabra disabling Dig as soon as I try to use it costing me to waste a turn and go into War Turtle at 6 HP, but I like to think that no healing makes me sound more tough, so we're going to go with that. On the second attempt, I still don't heal, but Dig doesn't get disabled, and that allows me to use my strongest move to basically one-hit all the relevant Pokemon. After the battle, I make an executive decision to fight some of the easy trainers on the ship, as well as get the rare candy that I normally skip. I'm thinking ahead to some of the tougher battles we got left, and since minimum battles isn't a thing already, it just seemed like the move at the time, and we'll just have to see how this affected our end time later, won't we? After picking up an extra level or so, I grab Cut, and I head over to Lieutenant Surge for what should be a challenging battle. After sweating over a really close battle with Surge, I obtain the third badge. And anyone who is only listening to this is probably checking the video to see if I actually had a tough battle. I'm sorry I made you double check. It was an easy battle. It's ground type. You know. You know how Pokemon work. You know how the Pokemans work. Progressing forward, Rock Tunnel isn't a problem. I do have a funny battle with the infamous double Geodude Graveler Hiker. 
Uh, turn one, I dig underground. Geodude self-destructs. Uh, then Geodude number two comes out, and he gets hit by the dig that I had already prepared the previous turn for the other Geodude. And then Graveler comes in, I dig underground once again, and then it self-destructs. It just it just got a sensible chuckle out of out of me, and maybe somebody else will too. Get over to Celadon City, and I pick up a Sodi Pop, and I get Rock Slide by trading it to this little girl, and I immediately head off to the Rocket Hideout. And it's important to note from this point on, I'm really not battling any extra trainers anymore. I'm trying to make up the time that I lost because I feel that Sandshrew is at a sufficient point to where, with good pathing, I can reach at least the Elite Four without doing any extra battles from this point if I play smart and correctly. With that said, Giovanni number one doesn't pose much of a challenge. In fact, Sandshrew is starting to pick up steam to where it doesn't even need to heal that often. HH training is really paying dividends at this point in the game. Afterwards, I pick up Fly, and then we head over to Pokemon Tower to face rival number four. And like most runs, you usually have a significant level advantage by the time you make it here. But this is an excellent chance to get use out of our shiny new move, Rock Slide. I always love it when I get to use this. I just, I love it when I get to use physical movesets in Generation 1. I love it. After Pokemon Tower, our level and timing leads me to believe that it's time to take on Erica, which is another potential hurdle in the run. And luckily I had the foresight to go ahead and train as I progress just for this occasion. I head into my first attempt and I'm flabbergasted that I actually outspeed the Victory Bell. And I know I have a level advantage, but Victory Bell has excellent base speed and it's a third stage Pokemon. I make it all the way to Vileplume the first attempt, but I get put to sleep and while I'm asleep, I'm not going to survive Mega Drains and Petal Dances. The second attempt goes just like the first one, but I get a heavy hit from Dig, and that leads to a retroactive Super Potion by Erica on the Vile Plume, and it gives me a free second Dig that finishes the battle. I'm pleasantly surprised about this one. I expected this one to be much harder than it actually was. And from here, I deviate from my usual Saffron City inclination, and I go ahead and I go face Koga. The top matchup is much better, and I always struggle when I get stuck in Silphco. It happens every single run. And that turns out to be an excellent decision. Koga's initial Pokemon all get dug their own grave, and finally at the end, Weezing decides that I'm not going to take it alive, and it self-destructs. It does very heavy damage, but luckily I was at full health and I was able to tank the Weezing Shotgun Blast to the face. With that, another badge is down and more importantly, the speed badge boost is unlocked, which is generally key for me to eek past Rival Fievel. While I'm in Fuchsia, I go ahead and pick up Surf and the Teeth from the Safari Zone. And at this point in the run, I think Blaine would be uh, preferable to Silphco, but I'm afraid finding a water type to use Surf on might take too much time since I usually use the free Lapras. So I decide I, it's time to head over to Saffron in hopes that we can kind of keep up this pace. And Rival Fievel does not disappoint. The first attempt, I'm able to make it to the very end, but I fall short. Notice that Rock Slide is just a tiny bit off from one-shotting the Pidgeot. I get consistently chipped down and I'm far too low to compete with the Blastoise by the time I make it there. The second attempt is far worse. Uh, it's this Execute right here, this Eggman. It's always the bane of my existence. It's able to fully paralyze me and leech seed me and I just see the writing on the wall and I go ahead and reset. Thankfully, Silphco has two very crucial and powerful TMs for Sandshrew, so I go ahead and pick them up. Swords Dance and then Earthquake will both be in my final moveset of the game, so I go ahead and just go ahead and grab them. And I originally kind of hoped that I could wait till after Giovanni so that I could pick them up without fighting any extra trainers, but whatever. And what a difference a single move can make. We redo the fight, and a single Swords Dance is just what I needed to be able to one-hit the Pidgeot with Rock Slide. I take my chances, and I take some chip damage from Growlithe so that I can set up the rest of my Sword Dances. And then with my boosted stats, it goes down easily to an Earthquake. I send Execute to the Shadow Realm with a thrice boosted Body Slam, and then I tell him to make room in there for Alakazam. Next up is Blastoise, and I surprisingly one-shot it. Sandshrew's 75 attack with Sword Dance is no joke. Afterwards, like always, Giovanni is anticlimactic, 
And I set up Swords Dance and then Earthquake. Strategy. Watching the footage back though, I will say that it was a mistake to go ahead and put Earthquake on Sandshrew. While it is Sandshrew's best move, Dig would have allowed me to save some extra time after segments like Silphco, uh, Sabrina, Pokemon Mansion, and Blaine. Those are all diggable locations. Escape ropes could have served the same purpose, but it's worth noting that I could have been more optimized than I actually was. And like the old saying goes, when in Rome with a sand shrew. Since I'm in Saffron, I figured it's better to go ahead and face Sabrina rather than backtrack. I'm confident after handling rival number five after all. I don't even try setting up versus Kadabra. And I take it out as soon as I can get the chance with an earthquake. Mr. Mom is the weak link on the team. Well, he's the weak link on every team he's on. Uh, so this is where I decide to set up some Swords Dance for insurance. This guarantees that the rest of the Pokemon, including the Alakazam, will fall victim to a one-hit earthquake. And now we're really picking up some speed in the run, and dare I say, we're surpassing the shadows of AJ that have been cast upon us. I surf down from Pallet Town, I get my feel of another heaping helping of Tombstoner, brother, and I go to fight Blaine. Now this one should be easy, and you wouldn't be wrong, but the first attempt, I think that Earthquake alone is just enough. I don't even need Sword Dance, we're just gonna Earthquake this guy. But Arcanine, he outsped me, uh, and he hits a critical Fire Blast, and it made me change my mind. On our second attempt, I opt to take whatever damage the Growlithe wants to dish out in order to fully set up Swords Dance. And it turns out to be the correct decision because now I'm able to outspeed everyone and I get off all the super effective earthquakes in the world on our way to the seventh badge. With one badge left, it's time for Giovanni number three, and you know how this one's gonna go. Swords dance on the Rhyhorn to set up the sweep of the rest of the team. There's not much to say here. And now we potentially only have six more battles left to go before the end of the game. But everyone knows that any Pokemon can look good for the regular season. It's playoff time. This is where a Pokemon is made or broken. First up, it's rival number six. And the first time, everything is going great. Swords Dance into a Rock Slide handles Pidgeot. Rhyhorn and Growlithe both get bonked. But the problem arises with Execute, and it's not because it's annoying Pokemon. It actually gets knocked out in one Body Slam. But the problem arises when I level up after the fight, I lose my badge boost obtained from Swords Dance. I can still get past the Alakazam without much of an issue, but the problem is that Blastoise outspeeds me and he hits a Hydro Pump for massive, super effective damage and ends the fight. But now with this knowledge in mind, I go back into the fight. I set up just one Swords Dance to make the first few Pokemon manageable. And this time you can see the difference the extra Swords Dance made against the Execute. This time it takes three Body Slams to go down, and I get Leech Seeded and chipped down to about half health. So we beat the Execute, I level up, and I have the scary decision to set up my last two Swords Dance on Alakazam. And it does work out pretty much due to bad AI move selection. And this time when the Blastoise comes in, I actually outspeed it. And this time I hit a massive earthquake to end the fight. And it's gotta be said that Sandshrew's damage output is impressive. Being able to one-shot Blastoise while at a level disadvantage is something that must be mentioned as a highlight in what has been a pretty stellar run for Sandshrew so far. And you know why I say that. Remember, in the Cubon video, right? The regular season was pretty great. I was having a really good time, and I was heading unknowingly face first into the buzzsaw that was Lorelei. And it goes without saying that ground is weak to ice, and I've already been through this song and dance with Cubon. I know Sancher has better stats, I know he has Swords Dance, but I don't know if that's enough to make me just be able to sweep through the Elite Four in my first few tries. So I make it to Victory Road, I skip the trainers just in case I'm wrong because I can always return back here for extra levels if I need to. And now, I'm gonna let you see what happens on the very first Lorelei attempt. It's not even close. I'm outsped, and a non-critical hit Aurora Beam, which Lorelei's good AI will always go for on turn one, can just one hit me. There's no way out of this. So just to see how far I'm off, I use seven of my 10 rare candies to see how Sandshrew fares, and at this point, it's not much better. Rockslide can two hit the Dugong, but an Aurora Beam still 
pretty much puts me in a wheelchair going into Cloyster. And at this point, I'm aware that I'm not going to be able to beat Bellsprout's current record. But I'm proud of this little guy for even being close at this stage in the game. So I head back to Victory Road and I battle all the trainers there. And normally this is the type of leg work that you'd cut out when editing. But I feel like it's important to note how, how difficult these trainers were. The matchups were just brutal. The very first trainer I talked to, it just has a victory bell. I, I go down to one. I have to try it a couple of times. This is my successful attempt. And then there's this guy right here next to her that has a Blastoise. What about this guy with a Cloyster? I don't even really want to mention this Parasect that was a nightmare to take on. I won't even get into the semantics of why Spore is the most broken move in Generation 1. The whole point being is that there were more than a few incredibly rough trainers for Bellsprout. Bellsprout, what? For Sancho to deal with. And I feel it wouldn't be thorough to just say, I fought the trainers, now I'm going to try Lorelai once again. So anyway, I fought the trainers, and now I'm going to try to fight Lorelai once again. I go for some more Lorelai tries, uh, but I do save it before I use my rare candies. And this is because I'm not sure if it's going to be enough, and it'll be easier to go back and grind in my 50s rather than 60s. So this process is really tedious because I try, I fail, reload, use all the rare candies, try again, fail, reload. You get the point, and this is just tedium personified. I'm also going to be editing this in a way where you'll see my Lorelai tries first, leading up to the final battle, and then my thoughts on it, and so on and so forth, until the champion is reached, rather than going by each individual Elite Four attempt. So I use all my time to grind, and I go back in, and I immediately get hit with a critical hit, and I have to reset, and I have to use all my rare candies over again. Very cool. I try several more times with no successes. And I start to feel like maybe this is a puzzle that can only be solved by leveling up. I took a deep contemplation on whether or not I was actually better than AJ at this point. It really hit me deep. But eventually, after a handful of attempts, a strategy starts to emerge. One Swords Dance on the Dugong allows me to tank a single Aurora Beam, and the next Rock Slide can one-hit it. Now, the first time I figure this out, I swiftly get taken out by the Cloister, but notice that I tried Seismic Toss because I doubted Sandshrew's attack against a Pokemon with the highest base defense in the game. I turned my back on Sandshrew when it needed me the most. AJ, forgive me. At this point, I have Dugong down. I have the Dugong strats down, but the Cloister needed some testing. I tried Rock Slide the next time, but I crit. It does heavy damage, but I'm not sure if it could one-hit it without the crit. On the very next attempt, I'm still not sure. I don't crit with the rock slide on the cloister, but it survives with just a little bit of health, and a retroactive super potion does allow me to just go ahead and get past it. And I'm actually able to get past Lorelai on this attempt, but this isn't the last attempt. I put this victory in here just to kind of show that it really only took me about a dozen times to break through this time, albeit with only 8 HP during this particular try. So now it's on for the final attempt versus Lorelai and thoughts on the strategy. You will always take an Aurora Beam, but if you Swords Dance on turn 1, you can more or less comfortably tank it, barring a crit. The Swords Dance also allows you to one-hit Dugong. It's worth mentioning that this is a range, and if you get unlucky, the Dugong can barely survive, but there's always a 50% chance of a retroactive Super Potion. Next up is Cloyster. The previous Swords Dance allows you to outspeed it, and give you a lethal rock slide. Now this is also a range. And here I hit the low end of it. I don't one shot it. But I do get that sweet 50% retroactive super potion. Allowing me to go further. Now this might be shocking to everybody. But I also believe that Slowbro is a range. I have failed to knock it out before. Next up is Jinx. And I never really had any problems when I made it this far. There is no range. And Earthquake will always one shot her. Rock slide probably would too but Rock Slide doesn't have 100% accuracy, so it makes it more risky. Lapras at the end is more or less the same as Jinx. I think one time I failed to one hit it, so it could be a range, and that's the fairly consistent strategy that I ended up going with Lorelai. Next up, everybody, give it up for Bruno, and I'm sorry if you're expecting more. And here's the, here's the real funny thing. I forgot to heal on the final fight against Bruno. 
I go into the fight. I'm at 50 health. I'm in the yellow already. On my original fights against Bruno, I only set up a single Swords Dance. But I still took some damage. So after all my runs through the Elite Four, I decided it's not worth the risk. So I set up three Swords Dance against the Onyx and sweep through the rest of the team with Earthquake. Now once again, I reiterate, I only had 50 health to start this fight. I forgot to heal, and the Onyx did three damaging attacks, and I still comfortably beat Bruno. If there's anyone out there that still thinks Bruno is respectable and deserves his spot in the Elite Four, show him this clip. Tell him I sent you. Third on the list is Agatha, and we know from the Cubone video how good ground types are against her team. With that said, my first attempt is absolute worst case scenario. Hypnosis into a critical hit Dream Eater forced me to go back to Lorelei. Forced me to Lord die. And this is the only time out of the five or so times I faced Agatha that I actually lost. The only thing I can say here is that it's far too dangerous to set up any sword stance uh, for the most part in this fight. You have to eliminate the Gengar as soon as possible. I'm confused going into the gold bat, and it goes for Super Sonic, which doesn't do anything. And since I might hurt myself anyway, and I can't one shot the gold bat, I decided to just go ahead and go for two Swords Dance to make the, the the rest of the fight trivial. And it does end up paying off. I end up one hitting the rest of the team. I don't outspeed the final Gengar, and I believe one more Swords Dance would allow me to. But the last Gengar on Agatha's team, it just feels like it always has atrocious AI. And it often does things like go for Dream Eater at full health or while you're not asleep. Or try to go for Toxic. And it just allows you to kill it for free basically. Uh, and it always feels good when Agatha isn't a struggle. Next up is Lance. And Lance is a problem. Why? Gyarados. Surprisingly I outspeed it. But it has a stabbed Hydro Pump. And it one hits me even without a critical hit. The next time I make it to him, I do try to see if maybe a Swords Dance can give me the badge boost for my special and maybe that's enough for me to survive on a range, but it's still not enough. I really didn't want to retry this fight until it missed, so I told myself I'd give it just a few more shots before I resort to simply leveling up until I can tank a Hydro Pump or find out if it's actually a range. And the extra grinding turned out not to be needed on my fifth try. I do a Swords Dance to put Gyarados in one hit Rock Slide territory, and it misses the Hydro Pump. It's all that Sand Slash really needed, and Sand Slash already has high defense. It can easily tank a Hyper Beam from the first Dragonair, and then I finish up setting up the Swords Dance Trio. This takes Sentry's attack to Ultra Instinct levels, allowing it to sweep the rest of the team without really breaking a sweat. AJ would be proud of me right now. And I know what you're thinking. Hoping that Gyarados misses Hydro Pump is pure luck and not in the spirit of the run. And to that, I say two things. One, I don't say between members of the Elite Four to make sure that I can't easily cheese fights for this very reason. And number two, and more importantly, I'd argue that this isn't luck at all and exactly how Hydro Pump always works. And let me explain that. <clears throat> Hydro Pump has an 80% chance to crit, meaning that statistically, one out of five tries it'll miss and that's exactly what happened i fought lance overall five times and one of the times he missed it if anything tell lance that maybe he should use surf because it has 100 percent accuracy and if he did that maybe i'd be grinding levels in victory road right now rather than rationalizing how hydro pump missing is inevitable rather than being a factor of luck we're moving on anyway now it's time to battle the champion I use my final rare candies and cautiously but optimistically enter the fight. Now Pidgeot only has physical moves and Sancho has great base defense on top of my AJ training. It's all led up to this. All the swimming, all the whips, it's all ended up to this. I set up my three swords dance without even the slightest worry about getting knocked out. And then Sancho, he goes to work. There's a tear in my eye. A rock slide then pillages the Pidgeot. Earthquake annihilates the Alakazam. Another Earthquake leaves Rhydon in ruin. Arcanine comes in just to be eradicated. Executor is executed. And finally up is Blastoise with its fantastic defenses, but Sandshrew, he could care less. An Earthquake, 
leaves Blastoise blown up. And that's it. Just like that, Sancher has done it. Not only that, but way easier than Cubone did despite being a very similar Pokemon with similar movesets. But why is that? And I'll touch on that in a minute, but let's talk about Sandshrew for a second. Now Sandshrew wound up with an incredible time of 5 hours and 18 minutes. That means it was roughly 30 minutes behind Bellsprout, and frankly that's pretty astonishing considering how much extra time that I had to do on Brock, I had to fight extra trainers for Misty, then I had to go back to the Victory Road and battle all those trainers, so it's just, overall, it's just fantastic. I also can't ignore the fact that I'm personally getting better at these kind of runs, and that's definitely a factor, but I can't really let that take away from how surprised and impressed I am with Sanctuary. Now, to go back and address the differences with Cubone, uh, we've talked about it at the start of the video, but there's a couple of huge ones, and the first one's what I just said. I'm just a better player right now at the red and blue solo runs. I'd go as far as to say that if I did the first few videos again, I could probably cut down those runs by an hour at minimum, if not multiple hours, just based on general game knowledge and the knowledge of what happened during that first run. But that still doesn't put Cubone anywhere close, and that would really be because Sanshrew, while still having a pretty limited move pool like Cubone, it picks up something very critical that Cubone can't learn, and that's Swords Dance. Swords Dance puts Sanshrew on another level. And if you play any MMOs, I'm a longtime League player, uh, you'll know what I mean when I say that Swords Dance allows Sanshrew to scale into the late game just in time for the Elite Four. Swords Dance allowed Sancho to hit harder than even the Snorlax did, and I was blown away with what Sancho could actually one-shot. And trust me when I say that Blastoise is extremely tanky, and it still crumbled to a Swords Dance stabbed Earthquake. I have no doubt that Swords Dance, coupled with the badge boost, allowed it to get past Laura Lee and ultimately the rest of the Elite Four much earlier than Cubone was allowed to. Remember that Cubone had to rely on Seismic Toss, and that's a move that I did teach Sanshrew at the end, but I ended up not even having to use it at all. If we look at the, the tier charts here of the other runs, you'll see that Sanshrew fits in at number 2, and clears the other mons by a, quite a large margin. And until I get more runs, I can't quite say exactly what tier Sanshrew will fall into, but my initial thoughts are that it's it's B tier for sure. And this is pretty big news because there are people out there that haven't actually played these runs, but they theorized what tier some of these pre-evolved Pokemon will be in, and they say that Sanshrew would have been C tier. And after this run, I adamantly disagree. I actually think as we do more of these runs, Sanshrew could potentially be considered A tier, but that's just for the future. Now right now, I can't put it up there with Bellsprout because it had to grind. Uh, Brock, Misty, Victory Road, it had to grind a lot. On top of that, I just it doesn't feel justified saying that Sanshrew is as good as a Pokemon that did the entire game with the absolute minimum battles that you could do, despite the time and levels being that close, but we can always go back and reevaluate. And that's about all I got for you today. This video had kind of a lot more numbers and analysis in it, and I really kind of poured some extra time to make this as informative as it was hopefully entertaining to some of you. And as usual, I appreciate anyone that shows me any kind of love or support in any way, and that goes double for anyone making it that far in the video. At this point, we are seven videos in, and I'm still having a pretty good time, so I expect some more to flow out. I'm not really sure how long I can keep up the one video a week pace, but I'll do my best to keep things flowing. But either way, this has been yet another Pokemon Red and Blue solo run featuring Sandshrew that's definitely better than AJ's, and I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!